Well, I, I heard about it when I was nine years old in, in 1981. Um, so at the end of the 70s, early 80s, the whole um, issue of Antonia Trinidad was quite uh, quite a scandal in Germany. And uh, we had a, a, a school teacher in elementary school who showed us a TV report on the Colonia Trinidad. And I very clearly remember seeing that thing and going home and telling my mother that there's this place in Chile and there are people who are kept there and they can't leave and they have to work. I, I don't think that the child, child abuse was mentioned in the, in the, the TV piece that we saw. But um, I had a really strong emotional reaction to what I, I, I saw then. And of course, I forgot about it for many, many years. And then uh, seven, eight years ago, I read about Colonia Dignidad once again in the newspaper. And I thought, wow, that's the place that, you know, that we knew, we knew about as a kid. And it still exists, and it still exists today. It's called Via Bavaria now, a Bavarian village. And um, I started to, you know, go online and research a bit and find out that it still exists. And I found out that the that the story and the subject is much bigger, bigger than I, I ever knew because um, uh, as a kid, of course, I didn't know about the political involvement of Pinochet and all, all that background. Yes. Um, well, I mean, the, the easy answer to that is it's a private property. They own it. They so the the story is um, or what happened is that Paul Schaeffer, he joined a small Baptist community in Germany in the fifties, and um, he uh, started to abuse the children already there in Germany. And um, then somebody, somebody anonymously told the police about that. The police started to investigate, and he was. I mean, he, he always had very good connections to the authorities, so he found out that they are investigating against him, and he knew that they are going to get him. So what he did is he sold everything. So this was a small community of about 150 people. They lived as a commune in one big building, and uh, the same style like in Chilean. So he sold everything they owned, and with the money uh, from that, he bought 30,000 acres of land in the middle of nowhere in Chile. And then, um, they, they took a boat and, and, and went over to Chile on, on, on a ship in 61. And um, so they owned the land. And from 61 to 98, that was the time that he was leading the cult and nothing, nothing ever happened to him. So he could develop his system of abuse and uh, you know, enslaving the people and brainwashing the people for 37 years. And that's, uh, that's a quite a long time. And then in, in 1998, um, he was hiding for about three years, most probably on the compound itself because it's so vast they couldn't find him there, the police couldn't find him there. And they had their own sort of uh, border with Argentina, so he finally escaped to Argentina and was discovered in Argentina by a TV uh, reporter in, in 2005. And then he was finally got to jail and, and died in, in, in prison. And it's still existent because they still live there. I mean, that's the, whole, that's the whole story, especially, I mean, a lot of the younger members, so the, at its peak, the colonia had about 350 members. And that's the funny thing, because it was, uh, it was this weird place with these people in, in, in these all, you know, clothes and stuff. But it, on, on the other hand, it was a very important play in Chile. Paul Schaeffer was truly the very best friend of the head of the Secret Service. He had a good connection to Pinochet. They had the torture camp underneath. They produced the poison gas. They produced the machine guns for Chile. And from 76 onwards, Chile was under a weapons embargo because the United States uh, turned their back on Chile. And from that point on, the Colonia bought the weapons for Chile. They had their own pol um, how to say, uh, poultry harbor. So they bought weapons from a German weapon dealer and then sold them on to Chile. They had their own airport. They had two jets. It was, it was. <laughs> A uh, funny, funny thing. It was one of the biggest ag agricultural producers in Chile. It was the biggest bakery. It was uh, one of the biggest gravel, uh, uh, you know, mine, uh, you know, gravel producers. So it was a small group of strange people who played an incredibly important role within within the country, and um, that's why it took so long. I mean, now two years ago, finally, twenty five of the leading men of the of the colony have been uh, uh, put into jail after years of trial. Um, and they had so many, still so many um, supporters within the, within the courts in, in Chile 
have done in books so, so long. But the colonia was e extremely well established, and um, and nobody, in a way, nobody can take away the land from them. Nobody can take it away from them. The very old generation, the founding generation, there about 90 years old now. I don't think they can live anywhere else because they have been living in that system for 40 years, 50 years, and I think they'll. I don't know. I don't. I don't see them living in a, in a normal society. The younger ones mostly have left. Um, so now there's 180 people are still still living there, and the really um, irritating thing is that they are trying to survive now by uh, you know tourism. So they are um, they have changed the the main building into a you know hotel and the, the main hall, the big room where all of those you know what you see the beatings especially of the women happens at the restaurant now. And that is, that is very strange because. You know, if you know what happened there, you're sitting there, you're listening to Bavarian folk music, which is playing like endlessly, and uh, you eat Bavarian food, and at the same time, you know what has been going on in that in that room, and that's really um, that, that's very weird. Yeah. Did they let you film there? No, we didn't film there. No, I've been I've been going there for I I, I went for the first time six years ago, and I've been going there back again and again and again like uh, for four years, because it was it took. A long time until well, there was a small group of younger ones who supported the movie. One of them was with us on the shoot as our expert, and he would say, "No, we wouldn't stand like this, and we wouldn't talk like this, and we wouldn't move like this." So that we really got, uh, you know, got it right how how it was. And so there's a handful of the younger ones who really wanted the story to go out because they're suffering tremendously from what happened to them, and that it's not being dealt with, that it's not being talked about. And so they helped us, but. Literally everybody else didn't want this movie to to happen because they are still trying to cover up and trying to you know ignore it in a way, and um, so it took to win over the trust of those uh, of those younger ones. It took like maybe three years of going there again and again and again, and finally after three years they really started to open up and they really started to tell me everything that they went through in their lives, and they were all born into the colonia. So until depending on their age, until. 20 or 30 years, they never left the compound. They never saw anything else. They just existed within this entirely closed world of Paul Schaeffer. And um, well, and, and so so they helped us. And the old ones, they they couldn't do anything against the movie. But I mean, for them, it's clear that I'm going to hell, and there's no it's it's not funny to them. So they are like totally convinced that I'm you know, um, and. Of course, we thought about whether it would be possible to shoot there, but I think um, nobody knows what would happen if you land up with an actor who looks like Paul Schaeffer, who behaves like Paul Schaeffer. <laughs> you redress everything to the 70s. I don't know. What, what, I mean, maybe they, they start to worship the actor. Even that's possible, you know. And um, especially the old generation, they, um, they, for them it's really difficult because if they condemn Paul Schaeffer, it would mean that they are also condemning their entire lives because they dedicated everything to that man. And so normally they would say, um, yes, we know that he made mistakes, that you know we didn't know about it then, but now we know, which is not true also. Um, uh, and, uh, but it's the first duty of Christianity is to forgive, so we need to forgive him. And uh, finally, there was never ever anybody else uh, like Paul Schaeffer in the sense that when he was preaching, uh, we could experience God through his words. So he was truly a man of God, and um, and a man of God finally can't can't go wrong. And um, and for whatever he did wrong, we need to we need to forgive him, which is quite shocking after you know what happened there. Yeah. Yeah. We can add a question. <laughs> <laughs> How did you channel um, the past of the dead? Obviously, this is quite very cold hearted and chilling. Um, so what kind of research did you do for the role to, to get you in that place? Well, it is working out. I mean, mm -hmm. My father would have said, I obviously didn't smack you enough when you were a little girl. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think what it is that nobody gets to be that horrible unless they are devoid of love and they are treated terribly badly and the brutality and ignorance and hardship are what they're used to, and that is how they then deal with life. 
And I think it was as simple as that, that when there's no love, you've got no love to give. And I think it was, I think it was as simple as that, really. Um, just, you see it over here um, with, with uh, social services. You, you, can see, you can see these poor children who are brought up, um, and they themselves are the ones who turn into the abusers because they know nothing else. And if you know nothing else, that's all you can do, really. Was it a difficult film to shoot? <laughs> well, <laughs> somehow every film is a difficult film to shoot, but I'd say it was a difficult film to shoot yeah. um, for many reasons. It was, in the first place, it was really difficult to finance. Uh, we initially <laughs> wanted to make the film in a German film, in German language, because we are all German. And then it turned out that it would be impossible to raise enough money from Germany uh, for to, to make a film. Uh, that size, and then um, then the choice was either to forget about the project or try to keep the footage in English and you know with a you know, potentially a bigger market. And uh, so then we decided about uh, the, to, to to go for the English version. Uh, but that was like after four years maybe that we were in, in, in you know trying to put everything together. Daniel was always attached also for the German version. He was German. So that um, he was there from from the beginning onwards, and then um, uh, you know obviously when um, when Emma um, took on the part, that changed the project into a into a different into a different film, which was absolutely great. And then the making of the film was different uh, difficult in, in 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 that sense that for financing reasons we shot half of the colony in Luxembourg, the other half of the colony in Munich, one day in Berlin, and the rest in in, in Argentina in Buenos Aires. And it's just, you know, it just puts a lot of pressure on you to recreate South America in in Luxembourg, <laughs> and um, and to split your main location in two different countries. So you're shooting like one direction in Luxembourg, and the other direction you're shooting like three weeks later in Munich. That's just, you know, you, you ju it's just a it's just a very you feel unsecure about whether that's gonna you know work work together and, and fit together. So. And as always, it was too little time, too little money, too little of everything. But that's, uh, I think, that's just the reality of filmmaking. Apart from that, it was also it was a great experience. And um, and uh, you know, it's you know, we we were you know on the same. We were with a great crew who who had this idea to 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 make the film work. And especially, uh, unfortunately, you haven't been in Argentina, but the Argentina part was really it was really beautiful. I got a question regarding the uh, role of the uh, German embassy at that time because, yeah. for what I saw in the film, they were the uh, they were they were shockingly supportive of the colonial Dignidad. Yeah, that's um, so the colonial in itself is a scandal, but the role of the of the embassy is like a second scandal. So um, what they did for more than twenty five years is so a lot of the members of the cult tried to escape because life was practically hell in there. Um, the entire compound was fenced in with an electrical fence that, as you saw it in the movie, if you touch it, it might kill you. There were watchtowers, there were motion detectors, there were spring guns. It was really, really dangerous to try to get out. And uh, the, the nurse's character uh, in the movie is a kind of a tribute to a real character called Josie Schmidtke, who was shot when she tried to escape. So that happened. When, so a lot of people tried to get out. Some made it over the fence, risking their lives. What they had to do, they had to go to the embassy because they didn't have passports, because the passports were all kept by the leadership of the colonel. And what the embassy did for more than 25 years is they sent them all back. And that's about the least thing that I expect from my embassy, that I, you know, I risk my life to escape from hell, that they just sent me right back into hell. And um, so the first, so the, as it says at, at the end of the film, there is a handful of, of people who managed to get away. The first one in 66, um, the second ones, two guys, uh, two people in 68. So these two, they hid in the Canadian embassy because they found out that everybody who made it to Santiago was sent back afterwards. So they were hiding in the Canadian embassy. They gave a long testimony about what's happening in the Colonia. So they couldn't be sent back because now other diplomats also knew about, about that. And in, um, in 76, uh, the photographs from the Colonia, from life inside the Colonia Dignidad had been published in a German magazine called Stern, the Star magazine, uh, which was the biggest magazine in Germany at that time. And the 
this course with Gamble, and the whole discussion was going on in their started. And then the German ambassador in Chile was told to go to the Colonia and check out what, yeah, whether that's true, what people are saying. So he spent three days within the colony and gave a press conference afterwards saying, I had free access to everything, I saw everything, and I, as the ambassador of the Republic of Germany, I give my word of honor that all the allegations against the colony, which is, you know, uh, torture and child abuse and all, all that, that's all a lie, nothing of this is happening, and if there would be more people like Paul Schaeffer and his devoted flock, the world would be a better place. And that's a very unfortunate thing to say for an ambassador. And um, so this carried on until 85, and in 85, uh, because the rumors never stopped what's going on in there, uh, another ambassador was told to check out what's going on. They didn't let him in because he was not especially a friend of the colony. They just didn't let him in. So he reported to, Berlin, uh, to Bonn at that time, to, to Germany, that um, he, he didn't get in, in, inside. So they said, but you have to. So he rented a helicopter and went to the helicopter standing, just landing inside the colony. And so as the, when the helicopter approached, they were just shooting at the helicopter. So he had to, to fly back to Santiago, never getting in. And that was the moment that the German authorities said, okay, so we're not sure what's going on in there, so let's just let's just ignore it. Let's not be supportive anymore, but we're also not going to do anything against it. And this attitude actually stayed like this for until, I have to say, until six weeks ago. So for 30 years now, nothing has happened. Um, all the archives concerning Colonia Dignidad, the embassy, what, what they knew and stuff, have been, um, have been closed, so nobody could even though after 30 years normally archives have to be open to the public in Germany, so they, they never were open to the public. And um, so, and we are very happy about that. Six weeks ago, the German Minister of Foreign Affairs screened a movie in the ministry, inviting uh, you know 500 diplomats and politicians and stuff. Gave a quite remarkable speech afterwards, saying we needed that movie to give us you know a push and an impulse to look at our own uh, history and ask you know questions about our own uh, behavior, and it's very obvious that we have uh, made horrible mistakes and uh, and decided to open the archive 